Yeah. Well, we're going to take as our text this morning the last <coughs> verse that we read from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, everything about Christianity is supernatural. Why do I say that? Well, the whole Bible, which itself, of course, is an amazing supernatural production, leads us to this conclusion. The Bible tells us about the Christian message, and the Christian message is all about the living and the true God and his activity to rescue people like you and me from the awful effects of our rebellion against him. It's about this God entering our world. It's about God in Christ coming to seek and to save undeserving, unloving people like ourselves. Christianity, you see, is not a human invention. It's from God and it's meant to lead us to God. It's about Jesus, who is God the Son, one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and this one God who is beyond human understanding, who exists in three persons, came in the person of the Son and took real flesh and blood human nature and said that in seeing him, we are seeing God the Father. And he showed by his very life and activity what God is really like. This Jesus, the Messiah, walked the hills and the valleys of Palestine doing good and teaching the people True truth, truth about God, truth about ourselves, truth about the world in which we live and about how we rebels can be brought back into a right relationship with God. What is more, it was in God's plan and purpose that this perfect human being was taken by cruel people and uh, was unjustly charged with crimes worthy of death by crucifixion. And in Jesus' show trial and aftermath, God indicated what really happened in the death of Christ. He, the sinless one, was paying the price that sinners like us deserve. At the same time, on that cross, God made clear to all that there is a hell as well as a heaven. His death was an atoning death, a death to rescue people like ourselves from the consequences of our sins and from the outcome of our disobedience to God's commands and our selfish, rebellious ways. So he died that sinners might be forgiven. He died that sinners might be saved from the hell that we all deserve and be brought to God and to the heaven that none of us deserves. You see, the Christian message is all about supernatural activity. Christianity is also about human lives being wonderfully changed, transformed by the, the power of God so that every true Christian is a divine miracle, supernatural. You enter a place like this and you come face to face with Christians who despite bodily weaknesses and frailties, yes, and are still work very much in progress as far as from being perfect in this life is concerned. But yet, 
We are what we are by the grace of God and the work of God within us. A supernatural divine work has been done at the centre of our beings. It's some, something we Christians don't appreciate as much as we should. The great divine work that has begun within. Nevertheless, when the watching world observes someone who has truly become a Christian, it's often the case that they can't understand it. They're mystified by it. Whatever possessed them to change in such a radical way. But all over the world is happening all the time. And in Islamic countries, I can tell you about them, despite being persecuted, hundreds are coming from that religion to the Christian faith to believe in Jesus and to follow him. There are people being transformed by the power of God all the time just as we find it noted and referred to many times in our Bibles. For instance, we have these amazing church letters, don't we? Written by Paul and, and Peter and John and others, which, uh, give a, which are given, of course, for all time. This is part of God's word to us now. And as a result of the evangelistic activity of these apostles and other people like them, churches were established throughout the Mediterranean world in the first century. And by churches, of course, we mean people who had heard the good news of the Christian message and had been profoundly changed and were meeting together to worship God and to build, up, build one another up in their faith and to encourage and, and love one another and to seek to spread the good news to others. Things that, in fact, we were looking at last Wednesday evening in our home fellowships from Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. These uh, new Christians had repented of their own sins and they turned to the Lord Jesus Christ to save them from the hell that they deserved and to bring them to the heaven Again, I say it, the heaven they didn't deserve. These early converts to Christianity were nicknamed Christians because they trusted Christ for salvation from their sins. And they became followers of the Lord Jesus and they assembled together under the leadership of pastors and elders and, and deacons. And the apostles like Paul who wrote to such churches make it clear that the Christians who belonged to these churches in Asia Minor, like Ephesus, had had their lives wonderfully transformed by the power of God. The one true and living God had been at work in the lives of these people, just as he had in the lives of all the apostles. And the way the apostles express this miraculous work varies depending on who is writing, but they're all wanting us to appreciate that Christians are the result of God's supernatural activity. <coughs> Peter and John, for instance, speak of Christians as those who have been born again. Peter begins his first letter, extolling the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And you notice Peter includes himself in praising God for this divine action in their lives. And we move to the Apostle John, his first letter, he also talks about this heavenly birth. Some people think that uh, this is a strange way of talking. Uh, it used to be very much so in the last century when, uh, when I was beginning uh, my ministry in the, the mid, uh, the mid uh, of the century. Uh, people didn't like, even church people didn't like to talk about being born again, but, but the Bible's full of it. 
As I say, John uh, talks about this heavenly birth. He states that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So you see, to be born again means that Christians love God the Father and love all those who have been born again by the Father. That is what was expected to be true of all those in the various churches that came into being in those early days. Those assemblies of Christians scattered throughout the Roman world of the first century were composed of people who had had this remarkable new heavenly birth. Neither Peter nor John were talking about something that belonged to the natural order of things. This was something above the natural, supernatural. It was miraculous, couldn't be explained by science. And of course, this talk of being born again, of course, picks up the words of Jesus to Rabbi Nicodemus in John's Gospel, chapter 3. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter, you cannot belong, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In the introduction to his Gospel, John, the, uh, the, the Apostle John makes it clear that we have the right to become children of God on account of this supernatural work of God in the person's innermost being. This is not a result of human will, he says, human planning, human effort, but something that comes from God alone. He writes, God gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, that is what John underlines in his epistle. This amazing truth that through the new birth we see the kind of love that the Father has towards his own, that they should be called the children of God. That's what it is. See the kind of love that we should be called the children of God? And so we are, as one translation puts it. A clear distinction is made by John between the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of the devil are slaves to sin. They do not practice righteousness. They do not love those who are born of God. Because if a person loves God, that person will love fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, who have also been born by God and who love God. When we hear such words from God's word through the, these apostolic writings, it helps us to consider then our own positions and where we stand. Let me ask you, are you a, a child of God? Do you know something of this new birth? But now when we, we come to Paul's letters, he doesn't use the language of the new heavenly birth to describe Christians. He speaks of Christians as those who were once dead, but are now alive. Again, you see, it's supernatural language, isn't it? Here in this Ephesian letter, God, who made us who were dead in trespasses, alive with Christ. It's like a, a resurrection. And again, as with Peter, Paul puts himself, even though he's from a Jewish background, he, he puts himself with uh, these non-Jewish Gentile background people and he says, we who were dead in our trespasses. God in his great mercy, love and grace has made us alive together with Christ. Can you say that this morning? You ever consider the thought that you, like everyone else, were once spiritually dead? There's a hymn by William Madsen that we sometimes sing. We could have sang it this morning. Lord, I was dead. I could not stir my lifeless soul to come to thee. Has God done something miraculous at the very centre of your life so that you can go on to sing the rest of the verse 
But now, since you have quickened me, since you've given me life, I rise from sin's dark sepulchre. Like what we sang from Charles Wesley, hear the breaking free from the chains of the dark prison. But in this whole miraculous activity in terms of life from the dead emphasizes even more clearly perhaps the supernatural nature of a real Christian. Resurrection, it's a miracle isn't it? Life from the dead, that's what literally happened of course in the case of Jesus after his crucified body was placed in the tomb. He rose bodily. If resurrection only meant that Jesus was spiritually alive, well the Greeks of the first century wouldn't have laughed when Paul preached the resurrection of Jesus. So when the New Testament speaks of Jesus' resurrection, it means physical, bodily life from the dead. Miracle. So you see, we are face to face with the supernatural in the resurrection of Jesus. Just as Jesus' virgin birth was supernatural. And the miracles of our Lord were supernatural. Likewise, the resurrection. So when we come to think about what the true Christian is, it's the result of God's supernatural activity, now of course in the spiritual realm. That's what we're thinking about here. But it's connected to Jesus' resurrection. Someone spiritually dead, made spiritually alive. But it's the divine power that actually raised Jesus' physical body from the tomb. That is the power that raises a person dead in trespasses and sins and makes them alive in Jesus Christ. And so this is why I can say that every true Christian is a walking miracle. A true Christian is not the result of psychological manipulation. A true Christian is not the result of special therapies. A true Christian is not the result of human engineering or trying to force belief in Christ on a person against their wills, not a bit of it. This is God, supernatural activity, making them willing in the day of his power. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Why do I emphasize true Christian? Well, there is much misinformation and uh, misunderstanding over this subject. When we were living in North London, many Jews lived around us. And when our daughter was in the primary school, every child who wasn't Jewish was regarded as Christian, <laughs> even though they might come from Hindu or non-Christian backgrounds. And as you know, many Muslims consider the West to be Christian today, when it's far from being so. In the United States of America, people my age will remember the time when uh, prospective candidates for the presidency were eager to claim that they were born again in order to gain the vote of the people. And something similar we are seeing in our own day, both in the United States and Russia, by leaders who claim to be supporters of Christian values, but their words and actions suggest that they are far from being Christian in the New Testament sense of the word. In New Testament times, a Christian was not someone who belonged to a so-called Christian country or whose parents or grandparents attended a local church. A true Christian, according to the New Testament, is one who has been born again, born from above by God's Holy Spirit, someone who has been raised to newness of life in Jesus Christ, who has turned to Christ for salvation. So it means something 
miraculous has happened at the centre of the person's being. So Paul sums up what he says here in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 10 by saying that we are, we Christians are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So he's not talking in this verse about the fact that we're all creations of God by nature. Yes, of course, we're all creatures of God. We didn't make ourselves, but Paul is not thinking about the original creation of all things here. He's telling us, these Christians in Ephesus, that God has done something wonderful in their lives, comparable to the original creation. There are other passages in Paul's letters that say similar things. You can think of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, where against the Jewish background we read, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And uh, we could substitute baptism for circumcision there. It's not uh, a question of uh, what way you're baptized or anything. It's about a new creation. That's the important thing. The old circumcision, like water baptism, points us to the spiritual reality in Jesus Christ. New creation. And the same goes, of course, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is Christ, in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Such words are not unlike what is said here in Ephesians, that Christians are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, this is as miraculous as the creation of the whole universe with all the wonderful forms and varieties of life and colour that we see all around us. It's the same with Christians. There's such variety, thankfully, in, uh, amongst Christians. Individual characteristics and differences. And you discover this variety among Christians when you meet together, when we meet together uh, for worship from different cultures and different backgrounds. While the heretical sects often produce lookalikes who talk and behave like zombies, not so. True Christians, God's creations, they display unique features appropriate to their own physical makeups. It's been my privilege to visit different countries and continents and meet Christians and worship with them. Some have become true Christians from nominal, nominal Christian backgrounds, others from Hindu backgrounds and uh, from Shintoism uh, and from uh, communism and from, uh, 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 what shall we say, uh, from humanistic backgrounds, that would be right and from various animistic backgrounds. But all became Christians through God's transforming gracious power. You see, Christians are God's work. God's workmanship. Created anew in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord this morning, then, then this is what you are. You are the result of God's special work. His recreating work and preparing us for the recreation of all things at the end of time. And you notice that it's by a Christian's action, actions, by the way they live and conduct themselves, that people can see the results of the divine action within each Christian believer. Nomin nominal Christians well, they can often live in such a way that there's no difference to not the non-Christian world around them. And it doesn't seem to bother them 
that they are no different. They just go along with everything. Their thinking, their behaviour, their attitudes are too much like all their unbelieving neighbours, friends and relatives. Jesus said that by their fruits, followers of Jesus Christ would be known. He said that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter God's kingdom, but those who do the will of the Heavenly Father. And of course, true Christians will admit that they often think and act like unbelievers. They can act too much like the world sometimes. We all can. But then they will become aware of their sin and they will repent and they'll seek God's forgiveness. That's the difference. They'll seek God's forgiveness. They know they're wrong. They're in the wrong and they want to put things right. True Christians will seek to do things that are pleasing to God and they'll be ashamed when they fall. When things don't go as they want to, the things to go, and they've done things wrong. They're sad, they're grieved, they've grieved God. Now that's the difference. True Christians are God's workmanship, created anew by God to do good works. Good work has begun in them. It's not a finished work, but something good has begun in them. You're not saved by your own good works, of course. That's made perfectly clear in this very passage. And like every other religion and cult, the true Christian message is that we are saved not by what we do or strive to do, but through God's grace alone. Through God's favour toward people who have no claim on God and who do not deserve anything from God. True Christians rest on Christ alone for salvation, from the consequences of all their sin and folly. Christians can't even boast about their faith because true Christian faith or trust in Christ is evidence of God's supernatural activity. It's a gift from God. But if God has begun a good work in you as a Christian, then you are to work it out in your daily lives. And God who has begun a work will see to it that it is complete on the day. This is great. We're not finished products in this life, as we've emphasized. Christians are to grow up in Christ and to become more Christ-like. Christians are God's workmanship in order that they might do good works that bring honour to God and that will be for the well-being of others. You notice something else that Paul adds before we close. He says that Christians are created in, in Christ Jesus. The miracle of the new birth, the new creation is in associated with Christ, in Christ, one of Paul's favorite phrases. A Christian is someone who is united to Jesus Christ, belongs to Christ. The earlier verses of this passage have indicated how a person dead in sins becomes alive. It's all in association with Jesus Christ. A Christian is made alive with Christ, raised with Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's the Christian status already in Christ. So we receive the benefits of Christ's life and of his death and of his resurrection. Indeed, we receive something of his very life in our innermost being, divine life. You know, John Wesley was fond of quoting a book written by the Scottish minister Henry Scougal, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. In fact, most of the leaders of the revival in the 18th century had read it. Life of God in the soul of man, partakers of the divine nature, divine life at the very heart of the Christian's life. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they may have it in all its fullness. Ah, don't you want that, dear friend, if you haven't this morning? Life, all it
its fullness. Life with God, beginning here and continuing into glory. A Christian is the result of God's amazing activity then at the very center of our beings. God becomes real to us and we want to live for him. We want to honor him. We want to love our fellow believers who love the Lord. Whatever their background, whatever their standing in society, and we naturally desire that those who are not yet Christians become followers of the Lord Jesus. We pray for them. We try to do them good. We seek to live Christ-like lives before them that will speak to them and also that we want to tell them of the Savior that we love and has done such great things for us. I'm emphasizing this spiritual, supernatural dimension to the Christian face because we can all become cynical, we can also become disheartened by what's going on in our world and in our country. We must remember God is still working very powerfully today in our world, often imperceptibly, invisibly, as Jesus suggests, like yeast in a lump of dough. But then you see the evidence of a changed life, and it's amazing. It's remarkable. And of course, I want every one of you here to know something of this remarkable, life-changing, miraculous activity of God in your own life and have an ongoing relationship to him, knowing him as your heavenly father through Jesus Christ and living to please him and to serve him and have meaning and purpose for your life. It makes all the difference to daily life and that can be the means of encouraging others to seek and know this life-changing activity of God. Is there somewhere here this morning, today, concerned about where you stand before the living God. Someone here this morning who has been moved, who has been uh, moved to consider what they've heard, the word of God speaking to them. Do not ignore it. Do not ignore it. If you print, repent of your sinful way of life and turn from yourself to the Saviour who is alive, he's there, waiting for you, open arms, he'll grant you forgiveness and you'll begin to find the joy of knowing God as your heavenly Father and you'll begin to experience life in all its fullness and you'll go back and say, Wow, this is God's doing. It's really marvelous. Wonderful. <laughs>